So welcome to unit 14 social psychology. Um, and today is module 75 conformity and obedience. Some of the most famous studies within the field of psychology we're going to be discussing. So these slides align with Meyer psychology for the AP course third edition. The learning target, there are three of them for this module. The first is to describe social contagion and explain how conformity experiments reveal the power of social influence. The second is to explain what Milgram's obedience experiments teach us about the power of social influence. Milgram's are some of the most famous studies within the field of psychology. And then finally, to discuss what the social influence studies teach us about ourselves and the power we have as individuals. Sorry, my mouse is going a little crazy there. Okay. So what are norms? Norms are understood rules for accepted and expected behavior. They sort of describe what we think of as the proper behavior, whatever that is. For instance, there are norms that guide teacher behavior and norms that guide student behavior generally. Would you say it would be a norm for a teacher to raise their hand when they want to talk? Probably not. How about students? More likely. Depends on the, the learning situation. But is it a norm that teachers sometimes fall asleep in class? Not usually, although it may sometimes happen with students. So the concept of social contagion, let's think about this. Fish swim in schools, birds fly in flocks, and humans too tend to go with their group. To think what it thinks and to do what it does. So behavior is sort of contagious. If one of us yawns, laughs, coughs, scratches, stares at the sky, or checks our phone, others in our group will often do the same. So some research has been done in this area by Tanya Chartrand and John Barr. They had students work in a room alongside another person, actually called a confederate. You've heard that term over and over again if you've listened to other um, modules. So the confederates are who were are actually working with the experimenters. Sometimes the confederates rubbed their own face, sometimes they shook their foot. Sure enough, students tended to rub their face when with the face rubbing person and shake their foot when with the foot shaking person. Chartrand and Barg called this the chameleon effect, appropriate name for it. So how does social contagion lead to empathy and fondness? This natural mimicry enables to us to actually empathize, to feel what others are feeling. This helps explain why we feel happier around happy people than around depressed people. You may have noticed this, I certainly have. Empathic mimicking fosters fondness. Perhaps you've noticed that when someone nods their head, as you do, and echoes your words, you kind of start feeling a little bit of a rapport with them and liking toward them. So is laughter contagious? Laughter, like yawns, is infectious. I find this all the time for myself. So this example is from Chewbacca Mom, um, which was a woman on Candace Payne who went kind of viral on Facebook Live, I think it was. Um, she discovered this because she was spontaneously hilarious about buying this really funny mask that made noises for her kids. And this video of her being like genuinely happy and laughing ended up getting, at this point, it's more than, than listed here, more than 164 million views. I feel like it's over 200 million now. Um, and it was actually the most, Facebook Live's most watched video in 2016. So that spontaneous hilarity was sort of infectious. How does social networking enable social contagion? Well, social networks serve as contagious pathways for moods, such as happiness and loneliness, drug use, and even the behavior patterns that lead to obesity and sleep loss. On websites, positive ratings generate more positive ratings, which is called positive herding. This phenomenon is called positive herding. So what research has been conducted on this social contagion by way of Facebook? Well, in a massive experiment on the 2010 U.S. Congressional Election Day, Facebook showed 61 million people a message that encouraged voting with a link to a local voting place and a clickable I voted button. For some recipients, the message also contained pictures of Facebook friends who had already voted. The results show that those who received the tell your friends you voted messages were slightly more likely to vote that difference actually generated an estimated 282,000 additional votes. So knowing what others are doing and feeling what they are feeling may actually impact what we do and feel. Conformity, what is it? You've probably heard the term before. The definition is adjusting our behavior or thinking to coincide with a group standard because of a real or an imagined pressure to fit in, okay? Um, it's a funny cartoon right there. 
I'll give you a second to look at it. So one of the most famous, probably the most famous uh, study within uh, the field of conformity was done in 1955 by psychologist Solomon Ash. He devised a very simple study to do research on conformity. Okay, so this is the image that subjects were shown. So a standard line versus these two compar three comparison lines. And you can see it's not really hard to tell one, which one, one, two, or three is a match to the standard line. So the subjects of the, of the study is given the line test and his accuracy scores are recorded. Then the subject is asked to join five other men in a room to complete the line test. The five other men in the study are all confederates of Solomon Ash. So they knew the purpose and intent of the study. So in order around the table, the men are asked for the answers to the line test. And in the first few trials, each answers correctly, as does the subject. On the third trial, though, the Confederates begin answering incorrectly. Ash was looking to see whether or not the subject will begin answering incorrectly as well. Will he conform? And it says he because it was originally done with all male college students. Um, and there are some really good videos on YouTube of some of the original studies, the Ash conformity studies. So you can see the actual participants going through um, and, and what, what they look like when they're conforming or not conforming to the group. So what were the results? In Ash's experiments, college students answering questions alone erred less than 1%. It was a really easy task, as you saw on those lines. It's not hard to judge which one matches. But what happened when several other Confederates answered incorrectly? Well, more than one third of the time, these intelligent and well-meaning college students were basically willing to call white black by going along with the group. They conformed. So why do humans conform? Why do we so often think it's others think and do as they do. Why would I ask controversial questions? Are college students' answers more similar when they raise their hands and more diverse when they use anonymous electronic clickers? Why do we clap when others clap, eat as others eat, believe what others believe, say what others say, even see what others see? So there are um, two different types of social influence we're gonna talk about. The first is normative social influence, one of these different things that cause us to conform. So normative social influence is influence resulting from a person's desire to gain approval or to avoid disapproval. Frequently, we conform to avoid rejection or to gain social approval. In such cases, we are responding to normative social influence. We are sensitive to social norms because the price we pay for being different can be severe. We kind of often feel a pressure to belong. And, um, and for, you know, there's probably good evolutionary reasons for that to keep us safe, but it can also uh, result in some really negative outcomes as well, our desire to belong and conform to groups. So informational social influence results from one's willingness to accept other opin others' opinions about reality. When we accept others' opinions about reality, as when reading online movie and restaurant reviews, we are responding to informational social influence. So this is the two different routes for social influence. So Stanley Milgram, who is he? He conducted probably one of the most famous studies ever in the field of psychology. He was a social psychologist, and he was a, actually a high school classmate of Philip Zimbardo, who we've mentioned many times in, this, in, in these lectures and then a student of Solomon Ash, who did the conformity studies. So Milgram knew that people often give in to pressures, but what about outright commands? Milgram wondered whether or not people would obey commands. So he wanted to study basically the concept of obedience, okay? And so this quote right here by Adolf Eichmann, who was the director of uh, the Nazi deportation of the Jews to concentration camps. And Milgram was really interested in studying obedience because he had some relatives that had been in the concentration camps and part of what was happening in Nazi Germany. So this was not, you know, just a couple decades after that. And um, so Adolf Eichmann, I remember learning about this, said, I was only following orders. He was saying, I just was being obedient to those in higher command. That was how he was able to uh, deal with the atrocities that he was committing. So one of the motivating forces behind Milgram's work was the desire to understand why Nazi soldiers followed orders to kill millions of Jewish people in the Holocaust. So that was one of the things that he was really trying to understand. Was there something different 
um, that was happening in Nazi Germany that couldn't happen somewhere else? Or, you know, would most people be obedient to follow the commands of those who they perceived in a, in a higher authority? Well, so the research he conducted over the course of more than a decade from 1963 to 1974, um, he conducted over 20 replications of, and trials of his now very famous obedience studies. More than 1,000 people participated over the course of this elaborately designed study. The surface story of the study was simple. Learners would attempt to remember a series of paired words. Teachers would provide electric shocks to the learners when they incorrectly matched the pairs. So here's a, an example of what the um, electric shock generator looked like, okay? So this is the shock generator. Milgram very carefully walked the teachers through the details of the shock generator, even giving the teacher a small sample shock. And the teachers and the learners, they thought they were being randomly chosen, but the learners were always confederates of Milgram and his experimental team. So the learners hooked up. Milgram also made certain to show the teacher how the learner in the adjacent room would be connected to the shock generator. But the reality was the electric shock generator with shock levels depicted all the way up to 450 millivolts or XXX was actually fake. No electric shocks were ever given to the learner but the teachers thought that, that, would, that they were getting shocks. So the learner was a confederate, as I said, part of the research team. He was in on it. The learner never received any electric shocks. So that's important to remember. So the elaborate design of the experiment let the teacher, the real subject in the experiment, believe he or she was administering shocks to the learners for incorrect answers. In reality, Milgram was researching just how far the subject would go in administering electric shock because he or she had been told to do so by an authority figure. So what were the predictions? What did Milgram and other um, mental health professionals think would happen? So before undertaking the experiment, Milgram asked non-participants what they would do. Most were sure they would stop soon after the learner first indicated pain, certainly before he shrieked in agony. 40 psychologists agreed with that prediction. I'm sorry, psychiatrists. But the results were literally shocking. When Milgram conducted the experiment with other men aged 20 to 50, he found that more than 60% fully complied right up to the last switch, the XXX switch. When he ran a new study with 40 new teachers and a learner who complained of a slight heart condition, the results were still similar. And here's a visual of the results. A full 65% of new teachers in his later trial obeyed the experimenter right up to 450 volts. So what were some of the variations of the initial research design? Milgram conducted many variations of his research design, modifying the research conditions in many, way, many ways. For instance, in one trial, the learner was seated next to the teacher and the teacher had to lift the learner's arm to place it on a shock plate. Obedience was highest when certain things happened. The, perceived, the person giving the orders was close at hand and was perceived to be a legitimate authority figure. So this person was wearing a white lab coat in this instance. The authority figure was supported by a prestigious institution. Conducting the study on the Yale campus versus downtown Bridgeport increased obedience. The victim was depersonalized or at a distance, even in another room. And there were no role models for defiance. All those things, um, led to higher levels of obedience. So if you do take the AP exam, three of the most famous research projects in psychology were done by social psychologists and you've now read about them all. So you should be able to, getting through this course, be able to identify the Zimbardo Stanford Prison Study, the Ash Conformity Studies, and the Milgram Obedience Studies. Those three very, very important studies within the field of psychology. So how does evil reveal itself? So Zimbardo, Philip Zimbardo said, all evil begins with 15 volts. In any society, great evils often grow out of people's compliance with lesser evils. Milgram, using the foot in the door technique, began with a small level of shock, 15 volts, and escalated it step by step. In the minds of those throwing the switches, the small action became justified, making the next act tolerable. So it happens when people succumb gradually to evil. How does the situation impact the expression of evil? Cruelty does not require devilish villains. 
All it takes is ordinary people corrupted by an evil situation, according to the researchers. Ordinary, st ordinary students may follow orders to haze initiates into their group. Ordinary employees may follow orders to produce and market harmful products. And ordinary soldiers may follow orders to punish and then torture prisoners if the conditions are, um, you know, the right conditions to, to cause this to happen. So are there some people who resist obedience and conformity? Yes, there are some people. There's an interaction between the people and the environment, for sure. Some people do resist. When feeling pressured, some react by doing the opposite of what is expected. The power of one or two individuals to sway majorities is called minority influence. So here's a minority of one, a very powerful picture from Nazi Germany. To be August Landmesser, standing defiantly with arms folded as everyone else salutes their allegiance to the Nazi party and Adolf Hitler requires extraordinary courage. But sometimes such individuals have inspired others, demonstrating the power of minority influence. So what have social psychologists learned about the power of the individual? Well, social control, the power of the situation, and personal control, the power of the individual interact. Rotten situations turn some people into bad apples, as Zimbardo demonstrated in the Stanford prison study, but those same situations can cause some people to resist and become her heroes. And definitely within psychology, more research needs to be done to understand what is it that makes some of those people not conform in those situations. So back to the learning target reviews. Social contagion, also known as the chameleon effect, is our tendency to unconsciously imitate others' behaviors expressions, postures, and inflections and moods. It's a form of conformity. Social networks serve as contagious pathways for moods, both good and bad. We may conform to gain approval, normative social influence, or because we are willing to accept others' opinions as new information, informational social influence. Solomon Ash, we should be thinking um, of the Ash conformity studies when we hear his name and others found that we are most likely to adjust our behavior or thinking to coincide with the group standard when the following things are present. We feel incompetent or insecure. Our group has at least three people. Everyone else agrees there's unanimity. We admire the group's status and attractiveness. We've not already committed to another response. We know we are being observed and our culture encourages respect for social standards. All those things can increase the likelihood of conformity. Stanley Milgram's obedience experiments in which people obeyed orders even when they thought they were harming another person demonstrated that strong social influences can make ordinary people conform to falsehoods or give in to cruelty. Obedience in those studies was highest when the following conditions were present. The person giving orders was nearby and was perceived as a legitimate authority figure. The research was supported by a prestigious institution like Yale University in the case of the Milgram obedience studies. The victim was depersonalized or at a physical distance and there were no models for defiance. Finally, these experiments have demonstrated that strong social influences can make people conform to falsehoods or capitulate to cruelty. The power of the individual, the personal control, and the power of the situation, the social control, interact. A small minority that consistently expresses its views may sway the majority though, as may, may even a single committed individual can end up changing things. If a single individual steps up and doesn't conform to the group. All right, we are at the end of this module. Thank you for listening, take care.